The story of phosphorus is the story of life itself. Basically, without phosphorus, we can't produce food. It's as simple as that. Phosphorus is the chemical backbone of DNA. Every cell, every plant, every living thing needs phosphorus to survive and grow. Each of us is full of it. So much so that phosphorus was first discovered back in 1669 by a German alchemist who distilled it from 50 buckets of human urine. More on the urine a bit later. For now, meet a chunk of pure phosphorus. It's kept underwater because it's so unstable. Although one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust, phosphorus is never found in this elemental form in nature because it's so incredibly reactive. Such is the energy it can release that when I expose it to air, it reacts with oxygen and bursts into flame. It's exactly this capacity to combine with what plants need that makes it such a useful fertiliser. In the natural world, phosphorus is safely locked away in phosphate rocks. They build up as sediments on the seafloor from river runoff or from bird droppings on islands like Nauru. Chemical processing unlocks the power of phosphorus from these ancient rocks to make the superphosphate fertilisers that maintain global agriculture. Phosphate deposits take millions of years to form, but after less than a century of mining them for fertilisers, there's serious concern that the available resources are running out. We know that without uh, the products that we manufacture, uh, we would not be able to feed the 7 billion people we have now and the 9 billion we will have in the future. We have at least three meals a day, and without phosphorus, you can't have those three meals a day. Having lunch with sustainability researcher Dr Dana Cordell gives me plenty of food for thought. The phosphorus that's sitting here in our food today might have started its life um, in a phosphate mine in Western Sahara and then shipped to the US for processing into fertilisers and then shipped to Australia for application on Australian soils. Discovering how much is embodied in food has led Dana to a vegetarian diet. Our research is telling us that to support a meat-based diet um, like what you've got, you probably take about two to three times more phosphorus um, than, than we would need to support a vegetarian-based diet. Meat is more phosphorus intensive because of the crops grown to feed the livestock. While Australia has naturally phosphorus deficient soils, we've at the same time invested in phosphorus intensive um, export commodities like live sheep, beef and, and wheat, which require a lot of phosphorus input, phosphorus fertiliser input, for the output that we get. All this leaves our economy vulnerable to future shocks of phosphorus scarcity. We've really reached this situation where Australia is completely addicted to phosphate and about half of that comes from imported sources. Like peak oil, she warns that the world is fast reaching the time when global production of available phosphate supplies peak and then start to decline. If farmers can't access phosphorus worldwide, we'll see a decline in global crop yields. So when's the crunch point? Well, our analysis is showing that we're likely to see a peak phosphorus um, event within the next few decades by 2035. Phosphorus is a finite resource, however the current analysis of peak phosphorus is, is somewhat flawed in the sense that it is based on data that are uh, obsolete. The data preferred by the fertiliser industry show there's enough phosphate rock to last another three or four hundred years. We will be able to provide uh, phosphate for many, many uh, decades to come. But no matter the year, there will be a peak. And Dana believes we need to prepare for when it comes, sooner rather than later. What we saw in 2008 could certainly be a, a glimpse of the future in terms of what a phosphorus scarce future might look like. And it certainly wasn't a pretty one. Across the developing world in 2008, hungry people rioted as food supplies ran low and the price of phosphate rock spiked by 800%. This showed us that we currently do not have any institutional structures that can cope with that kind of a shock. And no government, let alone the UN, is doing anything about it. A 
good start would be to use more of what we mine and waste less. 80% of the phosphorus that we mine for food production is actually getting lost throughout the food production and consumption chain. Which brings me back to urine. Because nearly all of the phosphorus eaten in food is excreted, urine is the single largest source of phosphorus coming from cities. What's special about this toilet? Well, what we're doing here is we're trialling um, urine separation via a urine diverting toilet, which means the urine has to get captured at the front. We need to start mining our waste and use it for agriculture. But if we were going to roll that out across Australia, we'd actually need to think about how we're going to um, logistically recover that phosphorus. Plus, men would have to sit down to pee, wouldn't they? Absolutely. When we talk about food, we think about soil and water, carbon and climate change. Now, we need to talk about phosphorus as well.